It's a special edition of VLGA Connect. I feel like I say that a lot, but it's true this time. It's the newsroom budget edition, and you can tell it's special because I've got both Steve Cooper and Catherine Arndt with me. Hi, guys. Hi, Chris. Hi, Steve. Hi, Catherine. I feel like I'm encroaching on on a sort of a, you know, a well-received um, successful formula of of the tag team that you do but I as I said um just before we hit record I, I'm simply carrying the watermelon today well I don't think so Catherine I think this session has the sort of I'm expecting the sort of gravitas that I would normally get in in the newsroom from you two so wait and see and I, and, and just in case um people don't know what the watermelon reference is um just watch Dirty Dancing and um you'll pick it up there or just ask someone who's watched Dirty yeah. Dancing. <laughs> don't, 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 don't bother watching it. That might be, no, that might be easier. All right. Uh, the reason we're here for this special edition is to look at the budget, the state budget particularly, but some of the federal budgets as well, to provide, a, I, I guess, a guide to what's come out of this for local government now that we've all had some time to digest. And there's a bit to digest Catherine and Steve. Yeah, look, there certainly is. And, and what we'll do to accompany this episode is we'll attach some links that will um, give, you know, viewers a really um, detailed uh, outline of what some of those budget initiatives are that we're going to talk about today. And I also, before we get into this, pay special uh, mention to Deborah Wu from your VLGA team, who did a power of work pulling uh, this information together, particularly looking for the local government aspects. And she's done a terrific summary, which is part of the information you're talking about, Catherine, that uh, we'll make available to people. Um, how should we do this? Let's just start at the top and work our way through. Uh, there's some big ticket items coming from not only the state budget, but the federal budget, particularly in relation to the mental health system. Yes, that's right. And we did have the uh, CEO of Mental Health Victoria on the program a couple of weeks ago. Yes, Angus Clement. Mm -hmm. uh, and he did point to this coming and described it as a generational shift. And I think everything I've read seems to back up that uh, that that claim that we're really going to see um, never before seen investment and attention given to to solving these problems. Three point eight billion dollars from the state government for uh, addressing uh, recommendations that have come from the Royal Commission into the mental health system, and, and certainly a lot more um, locally based services um, in in that um, allocation of money. Uh, targeting young people in particular? Hasn't that really just been a confluence of issues that we've had um, bubbling away issues around youth mental health, around family violence, about wellbeing generally, and COVID has really just brought that to the fore. And um, no money can be too much. Uh, absolutely right, Steve. And look, I do recommend uh, if people are interested in this, go back to the interview that I did with Angus a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he explains more about the collectives that are going to happen in every LGA across the state, but also these hubs that are rolling out. I think there's there's about 60 of them to happen over about five years. Don't quote me on that number. It might not be that many. But there's uh, there's a few rolling out on an annual basis in the areas of need. So you'll see a lot of attention on this at the local level. Yes, and they're community-based hubs. So one of the, I guess, um, themes of this budget seems to be investing in locally delivered services and um, programs. So I think we'll see that as we go through a number of the initiatives. Yes. Yeah, and visible accessible services locally um, has got to be a good thing. Taking, if we're putting the governance hat back on, uh, really uh, ramping home those links to the uh, municipal health and wellbeing plan and the importance of um, strong local partnerships. Uh, and it's an opportunity for that. You know, the, the impact of COVID and, and the fact that people have become, through COVID, just more aware of their community and, and the services and, and, and um, what, you know, how, how accessible or inaccessible their communities can and cannot be. I think that's a really good point. And of course, as we record this, we're sort of getting back into that, uh, that phase of, of appreciating that too, as, uh, as, as we deal with another um, outbreak, which hopefully won't uh, go for too much longer. Um, Childcare, uh, also receiving a significant investment with $167 million for the, uh, the universal three-year-old three -year kindergarten. Um, understand the first time that that's going to be available again in every LGA across the state. That's huge. 
and very welcome, I would say, from all of, of you know, the 79 local government areas. Yeah, and I think that um, follows from a budget initiative 12 months ago, Chris, to, uh, to kick off that program. Some assets and infrastructure wins for a few councils in particular, Steve? Thanks, Chris. Good point. Uh, $17 million for Glenelg going into an employment fund. Uh, $10 million for new jobs in the Latrobe Valley. Central Goldfields Shire at Maryborough, $95 million for a new building at the Maryborough Hospital are amongst the, the priorities there. And then we could go on and talk about libraries if you like. Yes, um, Catherine, nearly $10 million for the Public Libraries Fund. Yes, that's right, about $9.3 million if I, if I saw those figures correctly. And it's really interesting. I, I attended a a meeting of the advisory committee for public libraries yesterday, which is a subcommittee or an advisory committee to the state library um, board, uh, chaired by Maxine McHugh, and really interested in the conversation around the table there about the role that libraries in particular play in communities and just how important they are beyond just the, you know, access to, to books, of course, but also as a place, a safe place for members of the community to go. Um, unfortunately, during COVID, um, people weren't able to go to the library, but the library delivered books um, to um, members of the community. Um, they've also, since they've reopened, um, looked at creating alternate spaces for uh, young people in the area to go and study. And of course, the VLGA runs um, the Libraries After Dark project in um, collaboration with the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation and Moreland City Council. And a number of councils have taken that up. And that essentially looks at creating an alternate venue for people after hours to go and, and initially establish to reduce um, the risk of people going to licensed pokey machine venues. But of course, um, yesterday we discussed at that advisory committee meeting just the, the, the possibilities for that program to be expanded. So I'm pleased to see in this state budget that there's recognition of the important role that public libraries play. Catherine, the VLGA has a strong role too in the, uh, in the programs to minimise the risk from gambling. And I see there's money for a Royal Commission into the casino operator and licence. I guess that's the sort of uh, inspection that uh, you'd welcome? Oh, look, I'm, I'm sure that there will that will be welcome news to, you know, a number of the stakeholders who have really valued from the work of the program that the VLGA undertakes on behalf of the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation, but also just, you know, broadly the community. We've seen a lot in the press recently about... Um, casino operations. So this, I believe, is a new um, amount of funding that's been allocated for this. I think Chris, that follows on from the, um, and the name of the judge alludes me, but the New South Wales report that made some rather unseemly findings in relation to uh, the casino, Crown Casino operation in Victoria and the government moved, or the Minister Horn moved very quickly to announce that, um, that Royal Commission. Steve, emergency management and planning is getting uh, quite a bit of attention with a few funding programs looking at a whole range of things arising out of bushfire recovery, for example, and, and other emergency management related. Um, all phases of emergency management, Chris, but we may as well start with recovery since you, uh, you mentioned it. So yes, $788 million dollars of infrastructure around bushfire recovery. And it doesn't, I mean, it seems a lifetime ago, but it's only 12 months ago that those resources were well tested through Eastern and Northeastern Victoria in particular. Um, $104 million for continued case support, financial counselling, mental health support, legal aid, and bushfire support for, um, and business support for local residents affected by those fires that I just mentioned. So $104 million tail at least um, to those fires. $3.8 million for schools and early childhood services in affected areas. Um, $28 million in emergency management facility upgrades. And at the other end of the scale, I suppose, Catherine and Chris, $384 million on strategies to reduce bushfire risk and uh, the Safer Together strategy. So a significant um, investment in preparation. 
which will be welcomed, I'm sure, particularly by those communities that have dealt with uh, those crises in, in recent times. And as we've said, Catherine, a number of times, I think on VLGA Connects, we've gone through a period of time where councils have, you know, some councils have gone from drought to bushfires to floods, and then we've had COVID. So, you know, it, the, they feel like they're in permanent emergency management response mode. That they do. And, I, and you know, that, that last figure that, that Steve mentioned looks at prevention programs and strategies to preempt um, those, well, in this case, the bushfire um, scenarios. So it's good to see some money being invested in prevention. I think too, Catherine and Chris, it's important um, to remember that for those of us who are not in the bushfire affected regions, we just move on quickly. Um, and the fact that there is this allocation is a salutary reminder that for those of us who aren't in the bushfire affected regions, uh, we move on emotionally. But those who are close, handy and affected really require a longer term community investment in the rebuilding of those communities, both lives and facilities. And, and perhaps that's also been, you know, the importance of, of reflecting on that has been captured in some of those new mental health um, funding initiatives. I might just whip through some of these others. So the Growing Suburbs Fund, which affects uh, those interface councils that are particularly dealing with the growth, another $50 million. I, I've noticed some of those councils have come out and said this is great, but uh, we do need so much more support. What sort of projects would they... Uh... They, that money be used for? Well, it's to deal with growth. So it's going to be about infrastructure, community infrastructure, possibly uh, um, road projects, et cetera. Um, you'll, you'll see a, a whole range of announcements, I expect, about those, some of which we've been seeing already, of course. So, you know, Casey's one example where there's particular road and community infrastructure programs that have received growing suburbs funding very recently. The metropolitan partnerships and the regional partnerships are continuing and there's $16 million in funding for those to continue. And of course, as we know, they are the preferred pathway, if you like, of advice to come from communities at that strategic level through to government for future budget processes. Um, they've been around for a few years now, so uh, one would assume they're serving their purpose. And, and, and just on that, it might be a good um, opportunity perhaps to, to get some representatives from those um, groupings to come on to a VLGA Connect program just to give us an update on Indeed. what we've been working on. On the community infrastructure uh, theme, so more broadly than just the growing suburbs, we've got $55 million for new and upgraded community sport and recreation infrastructure. And of course, this government's strong commitment to the Female Friendly Facilities Fund is continuing. Yes, and I think um, we might remember a number of years ago, a councillor at Bayside um, City Council, Felicity Frederico, led a campaign called the Grass Ceiling Campaign, which really did focus in on um, the lack of, um, uh, you know, female-friendly facilities, in, um, particularly in communities and, and sporting facilities. And I've got to say, one of the better named campaigns in recent time that comes to mind. Uh, Delwa programs, uh, so, you know, things for the environment and sustainability. Not sure if there's any you want to pick out there, Steve or Catherine, to mention in particular. Oh, look, just going back to my past, um, Chris, I was really interested that Port Phillip Council had managed to wangle um, $2.8 million for the redevelopment of their much-loved eco-centre, which is tucked away in the corner of the St Kilda Botanic Gardens and just does fabulous local work. Uh, that's a good pick-up there, Steve. I hadn't heard that one. Um, more money for land care, uh, money for the protection and preservation of natural environment, more broadly the Port Phillip Bay Fund for rehabilitating the ecosystems in the Bay, all very welcome uh, programs, uh, I'm sure. Chris, there's $5.2 million for pest and weed management. And it seems when we're involved in consultations with other levels of government around environmental impacts, uh, whether it's inland or coastal, that um, doing this sort of work in an environmentally or ecologically safe manner is really important. So that $5.2 million will hopefully be well spent. Roads and transport, uh, a lot of attention as you would expect with uh, nearly $400 million for a road safety strategy implementation and a similar bucket of money. Well, when I say similar, about hundred million less for um, planning, upgrading and maintaining suburban, rural and regional roads around the state. Never enough, but it will be welcome, Chris. Uh, and I think you touched on an important issue before around um, the, how critical it is of where it will be spent uh, because there are demands in all regions. 
Absolutely. And the table that will circulate with this um, episode will, I think, list by um, local government area where some of this, this money is going. True of every area, particularly around the country at the moment, there's a lot of focus on uh, more active transport uh, means, walking and cycling networks, um, cycling corridors, etc. And there's quite a bit of money in this budget for some of those particular projects in the eastern metro councils, I see. And haven't they been um, well used during um, lockdown when we've sought out every um, every available walking and cycling track close to home? So people have really become aware of the, uh, the importance and availability of those services. We've seen it in a range of ways, haven't we, Steve and, and Catherine? We're seeing uh, Yarra City Council, for example, this week considering extending the use of parking spaces for outdoor dining for another few months, but with a view, the, the media reports say, to making that a permanent arrangement. And we've also seen some interesting flip sides. I know in London, for example, one council has decided to do a backflip on uh, turning um, a road into a, into a cycle pathway, etc., uh, for a range of reasons. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where we sit with all of this another year or two from now. Yeah, and, and, and what it looks like across municipalities and, and what different municipalities are doing. As a Richmond resident, I'm certainly enjoying, you know, um, the ability to go and, and sit outside at some of these, um, you know, pop-up um, dining areas attached to the restaurants. And has Donald the Duck uh, taken advantage of any of that yet or is he still... Do you know, actually, in, in um, all seriousness, I think he has clearly fled around the corner and down the river a, a bit since they've started the construction of that four kilometre upgrade along um, from Federation Square to the Balti Bridge. The North um, Bank project. Yes, that's right. So mm -hmm. I haven't seen him around. <laughs> yeah, for anyone new to the newsroom um, broadcast, uh, this is a recurring theme and stay tuned and you'll kind of pick up the threads about Donald the Duck. <laughs> and, you know, I think Catherine's got a hotline to Parks Victoria to check on his whereabouts and wellbeing when she hasn't seen him for a while and, and right. they fully expect those calls. <laughs> So uh, what else have we got? Housing, of course, a massive issue for all councils uh, and a significant um, uh, tranche of investment for housing-related initiatives in this budget. Yeah, Chris, $252 million for housing support and targeted initiatives for homelessness, um, which has, again, become an issue during COVID where um, and many homeless people were rehoused in hotels. Um, $194 million for services to prevent homelessness, um, $26 million for early intervention for rough sleepers, $17 million to help Victorians housed in hotels during the pandemic to now move into permanent accommodation, and a local one, $9.1 million to build and operate a new Aboriginal refuge in Horsham to support victim survivors of um, family violence. And I guess, Chris and Catherine, my sort of sense on that is it ticks a couple of boxes. One being the obvious immediate sort of economic kick along um, with the building activity associated with much of this. Um, and the other, of course, is just the basic human right for people to have a roof over their heads. Um, and so very important sort of work. Obviously, there's a bit of an implication for local councils in terms of the strategic planning work associated with the location of some of the uh, the new facilities and that's had a bit of media press recently. It has and I think um, Chris we spoke last week in newsroom about a media release that came out in in advance of, of the state budget being handed down and that was the investment of 1.3 million dollars to assist people who are look, fleeing family um, violence situation to be able to accommodate their pets as well. So perhaps if we jump on to some new initiatives, I think we've covered the mental health initiatives um, in, in some detail. There's also been some um, funding attached to um, gender responsive, um, or, or sorry, I should say gender responsive budgeting measures have been included in this budget. Um, and, and in particular, the allocation of $4.3 million to actually set up and a, um, establish a gender responsive budgeting unit. So that's certainly welcome news. Um, 
and a number of initiatives within that, again, related to family violence, um, prevention and response. Steve, I'm not sure if you want to touch on some of the initiatives um, under the Multicultural Victoria banner. I will, um, Catherine, uh, thank you. But after I do a plug for the VLGA's um, ongoing training program around gender equality, um, and really a call out for people to have a look on the VLG website or our e-news because we continue to roll out a program for particularly targeted at those members of council staff who are not gender equality specialists. So gender equality 101 kind of training and we'll keep doing that for as long as we get registrations, but they've gone really well. And we did also run a session that went quite well for um, councillors and what they need to know in their role around gender equality and I'm sure if enough people, and it wouldn't take very many to call out for us to do another one, and uh, we'd be happily obliged. Absolutely. And, and, and Steve, this relates specifically to the uh, responsibilities of, of council under the Gender Equality Act that came in um, last year. Um, and, and we must also say that we've worked in partnership with Gender uh, Equality Victoria to deliver some of those programs, and they certainly did put in a comprehensive submission to the state government around the need for gender responsive budgeting measures. So well done to Gender Equality Victoria for, I believe, influencing some of the outcomes in this budget. And I guess my closure on that one too, Catherine, is a reminder that this is actually, these are initiatives that are actually a social good for everyone. And, um, and so great work there. Uh, multicultural Victoria, $4.4 million for multicultural communities recovering from the pandemic, um, including local facilities and a bicultural worker strategy. Uh, over $4 million support for targeted programs to support migrant and refugee women into employment. And $1.4 million for dedicated programs addressing racism, vilification and hate-based conduct. There's also nearly half a billion dollars uh, to support Aboriginal Victorians across a range of programs, which is pretty significant. In terms it is of significant, Chris. And, and I think the impact here for local government will be, of course, in... Um, uh, the making of treaty and local treaties as the work of the First Peoples Assembly works towards that. So um, the VLGA looks forward to being able to work with the First Peoples Assembly. And we've had one of the co-chairs, Geraldine Atkinson, on the program um, a few weeks ago, um, certainly to at least ensure that local government has a voice um, and, and um, you know, that we're all on the same page when it comes to, to that making of the local treaties. Catherine and Chris, I think um, the Europe, uh, the cost of the Europe Truth Commission, um, Truth and Justice Commission, which is a an inquiry that is expected to roll out over possibly three or four years is uh, referred to elsewhere in the budget. I thought one of the other really heartening things about um, uh, Aboriginal related expenditure is that there are examples littered through um, through the budget papers in a number of departments, but uh, all of them quite identifiable and a positive investment by the state. And Catherine, I know there's some disability related funding that's caught your eye that you think is particularly um, uh, welcome. Yes, look, I think uh, <clears throat> the $2.5 million that's been um, invested in the expansion of Changing Places initiative will see um, new fully accessible public toilet facilities across um, Victoria. So that will be certainly a welcome um, initiative in many communities. So that, that's quite a bit of time we've spent on the state budget and there is more of course, but uh, um, a real sense of lots of things happening uh, that will have an impact in the local government and local community space. Um, we probably don't have a lot of time left, Catherine and Steve, but in terms of the federal budget, which came out the week before, there was some significant uh, funding announcements there as well. Um, one of those being, as was expected, bringing forward 50% of the federal assistance grant funding to come before the end of this financial year. That's a few years in a row that's happened now, and councils are probably starting to um, expect and depend on that for, for cash flow reasons. <laughs> Well, isn't it going to be a windfall the year that they don't do it for federal government, Chris, the year they don't do it? <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. There was also an extension of the local roads, roads and community infrastructure program, uh, a further $1 billion over two years. So that will be welcome uh, initiative also in the federal level. More money for the better uh, Building Better Regions Fund. I think they're up to round six of that program with another 
uh, over $250 million coming in that round. Roads to Recovery has been a long-running program that uh, councils are well aware of, and that, that will continue with around, uh, well, nearly half a billion dollars in each of the next four financial years. Interesting that, Chris, and although I have to say at the risk of being political, somewhat disappointing that uh, the amounts allocated are reasonably stagnant over the next the next four financial years, according to the budget papers. In fact, in one of those, I think in 23, 24, it actually dips a little bit, which uh, not sure what the reason for that is. But yeah, you're right. It's sort of holding firm at around that uh, $499.5 million mark. For some reason, they don't want it to tip over the half. Oh, There's some um, funding um, that's been allocated in the federal budget um, in the disaster mitigation program. So that will be welcome in terms of drought response, resilience and preparedness, um, building Australia's re resilience and disaster recovery funding arrangements. But I was really interested also in the investment in the digital economy strategy, um, particularly in the peri-urban um, um, program. So that will be certainly welcome. And, and the regional connectivity program has, has seen some investment in there too. And I, and I guess COVID has only again highlighted the need, particularly in lockdown scenarios for us all to be able to um, have connectivity um, and how important that is. Some um, COVID response packages in the federal um, government, in the federal budget, uh, some additional arts sector support, that's not going directly to local government, but um, certainly will be supporting an industry that has been heavily impacted. And uh, there's also the circular economy investment, which ties in with uh, a lot happening at the state level as well. But we've we've heard some announcements of particular projects in the last uh, week or so that are being funded from that program. Um, th there's a whole range of uh, funding programs that will have some relevance for local government. I do see the $2 billion over four years in there for mental health, which will uh, support what's happening at the state level as well. I also noticed, Chris, $1.5 billion over four years for Murray-Darling Basin Water Resource Management. Um, and it'll be an interesting journey as to whether the federal and state governments can actually get their act together on water management in the Murray-Darling Basin. So we'll put some links in the show notes uh, and on the VLGA website to the, uh, the summaries from the state government. And uh, there's also a very good resource from the Australian Local Government Association online that provides uh, a summary of federal budget outcomes. Um, any final thoughts, Catherine or Steve, on how local government has fared this time around? I think at both a state and federal level, we've seen investment in um, locally based community um, initiatives. And I think that that is welcome and will certainly have some, some impacts for the local government sector. Steve, final thoughts from you? Yeah, I'd agree with Catherine's comments, Chris, that um, there's a recognition that um, to be effective, both in terms of the impact on communities and in terms of economically getting money out and circulating, that there's been a recognition at both levels of government that spending money locally is critical. Well, that's been a bumper edition of the newsroom. Uh, Catherine, anything less than 30 minutes in future weeks now is going to seem like a disappointment. We do hope people have found that uh, useful. As I say, we'll put some information in the show notes. Steve, Catherine, thank you very much for uh, your assistance with that budget summary on the VLGA Connect newsroom.